Eu amo a mamãe porque ela é. Liga! Because she chose to have me, because she chose to keep me. In a time and culture when girls and women are grappling with identity and value, my mother didn't speak or teach us about identity and our value. She simply modeled all that a woman can be and do. And so we didn't grow up with questions as to who we were and what we could be. I love my mom and I love my mom because she goes to work for us. I love my mom because she's my biggest cheerleader and because she's so goofy. It's because she helps me when I'm sad and she texts me into bed and she tells me stories and she really helps me when I need help and she does my hair. I love her cooking. Mãe, eu te amo porque você sempre me deixa feliz. Eu amo porque ela sempre me deixa feliz. Eu amo minha mãe porque ela faz tudo que eu quero. A razão que eu amo ela é porque ela me ensinou tudo o que eu sei hoje. A respeitar os mais velhos e a respeitar todos que estiveram ao meu redor. E sempre que nós dividimos alguma coisa, ela sempre dava o maior pedaço para mim, como comidas. I love my mom because she's nice. She imparted uh, values and not by imposing them on us, but by us seeing how she is, uh, how humble she is, how gentle she is, um, how patient she is and uh, she is also a very strong woman. I love my mom because she gives me the most love. I love my mom because no matter what, how sick she is, how sore she is, how tired she is, she always has time for me. She always has time to listen to me and to share her love with me and her word of wisdom. No matter what, she's always very positive and gives me a great um, set of words to, to go on for my day. E foi ela que me, me ensinou a amar a mãe. She always is there for me when I need her help and um, she always gives me the love that I need. I love my mom because she makes yummy food. I love my mom because she's selfless and she's constantly thinking about others. I love my mom because she's a great example of what it means to have faith. I love my mom because she has been a role model in my life. Because she reads me bedtime stories, she helps me with my homework, also she likes to play with me too. For that and for so much more, Janet Zibidai and Benny, I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Well, happy Mother's Day, Mama and Claude and Baguni. I love you, Mom. Happy, happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day. We, we love, love you, Mom. Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Mwah.
Good morning, Center Point Church. We are so honored that you have chosen to join us this morning. Would you worship with us as we sing about God as our liberator this morning? Ephesians 1 this morning, starting in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, 
He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, the accordance in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your sight to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Thank you. 
Well, thank you for joining us in worship today. We're so glad that you, uh, and honored that you participated with us. My name is Pastor Keith. I get to pastor Center Point Church. This is my daughter, Christy. She's a worship and fine arts director. And uh, we're just excited to be with you today. Christy, do you know what day it is? I absolutely know what day it is. You better not forget it. It is Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Dad, why do you love your mom? Oh man, just too many reasons to explain today. She she raised me and my two sisters on her own and provided for us, did whatever it took to provide for us. Uh, she made sure we were in church. She she uh, prayed for us every day and just invested in our lives. And uh, so shout out to you, mom, Virginia Edwards. Uh, I'm wearing a suit and tie just for you today. And I also want to give a shout out to Helene Colby, my mother-in-law. I love my mother-in-law. And uh, we're just so grateful that they are part of our lives. Absolutely. And to all the women out there, we want to just say that we love you and we honor you today. We want to celebrate you today after church at 1 p.m. from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, the Center Point staff will be outside of Fairfax Corner, our office, and we just want to say hi and give all the women a special gift from, from us to you today. It'll be our drive-by connection. Absolutely. And if you have kids today watching the service, there is a special, a special message that Pastor Brandon and Hannah have planned for them today. So the YouTube link is on the description beside, and uh, your kids are going to absolutely love the service that Pastor Brandon and Hannah have planned for them today. You know, as part of worship, we give. You know, part of worship is our giving. It's a tangible expression of our gratitude to God. And so thank you for everyone who gives. Some of you have given through texting. Some of you have given through online. Some of you have mailed in checks. And we are grateful for each and every gift. It just helps us continue the yeah. mission that, that we are on to expand the kingdom of God uh, here locally and around the world. And one way that we are supporting missions, and we support about 60 missionaries on a monthly basis, one of the compassion ministries that we support. It's called Convoy of Hope, which feeds 300,000 children every single day and also are, during this pandemic, feeding uh, 10 million people, 10 million meals. And uh, we want to be part of that. And we thought of a creative way to do that. We, we designed these t-shirts called Greater Than T-shirts because we are in this series. And if you'd like to get one of those t-shirts, just see the link and look at the t-shirts and, and, and just purchase one or two of 10. And uh, we, we would love to just support missions in that way. So Christy, why don't you introduce our guest speaker today? I would love to. This lady is an amazing woman of God. She's my mom, Pastor Esther Edwards, and she has a great message prepared from the Lord today. And just grab your Bibles, grab some notes, grab a journal, and get ready to receive a word from the Lord this morning. Happy Mother's Day. This is a shout out to every mom, wife, grandmother, great-grandmother, aunt, sister, and daughter. No matter what season you are in, you are uniquely made for the purposes of God. We celebrate you today. The one good thing about getting older is that I have some hindsight, having weathered many seasons myself. I remember the bliss of childhood wanting to marry my dad, but knowing he was already taken. I also adored my mom. I wanted to be like her in every way. She was a fabulous cook. She worked as an accountant and she took care of the home beautifully. So she was just such a role model for me. I remember the tumultuous years of middle school and high school, but so many times at the altar, the Lord would meet me in special ways. Because you see, in that season of life, I just thought so little of myself. And I really thought I had nothing to offer. But at those altar times, the Lord would again say to me that he had made me uniquely and he had purpose for my life. I actually later burned the diaries that I had written during that season because I didn't want to remember that part of my life, and yet it was a part of life that shaped me. I can still remember life as a single young adult, wondering if my prince would ever come. 
I certainly met a lot of frogs along the way. And he did, little did I know, that he wouldn't always be charming. And little did I know that I wouldn't always act like a princess. But a wonderful journey unfolded of a married life that I'm so happy that the Lord gave me. Then I remember life as a young mom, living an, in incredible joy as I held my baby for the first time. However, I was unable to live up to my own expectations for motherhood. I found all the more, as Nancy Ortberg writes about, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde characters that would come out in my very own life. The battle that raged between good and evil in my own spirit as a mom. Wanting to be a good mom, yet battling my own failures. Do you ever feel that way? Well, as I was gonna, as I was preparing for this message, I, I told my daughters about it. And of course, Christy just said, mom, you have to share just about the time you cussed. And I was like, oh, I thought you'd forgotten about that. <laughs> well, there was one time in particular, and you have, just have to know that in our house, it was, you weren't not only not allowed to cuss, but you couldn't even use the word stupid or silly. I didn't want my children being derogatory to one another. So we just had this rule that your, your language had to be edifying. So here I was doing laundry and I just had bought a brand new uh, canister of all detergent, liquid all detergent. And so I put the laundry in, I was, there was laundry on the floor and it, I put some in the, in the um, washer and then I had some in the dryer. And I put the canister back on the dryer and went away and did other things. Well, I had forgotten that the dryer was a little unbalanced and when I came back, oh my goodness, I'm telling you, the whole canister had fallen down. We had this much liquid detergent all over the floor, underneath the machines, in the laundry pile. I was, I was so angry at myself. I was angry at the machine. I hit the machine and I let a superlative fly as loud as I could. And when I looked up, there in right at the doorway was Christy. She was about fourth or fifth grade and she was horrified. The look in her face, like I had just done the worst thing in the world. I felt this little as a mom. I had failed my daughter miserably because I was angry. How many of you moms can relate? Just losing your temper. As a mom of teenagers, living the tension of being a mom, that everyone loves and yet often having to be uncool with the decisions you make. Hmm. I have four amazing daughters and I just have to say that each one of them brought such a joy through the years. But there were also a lot of seasons of just things we went through in relationship with each other. I have to also say that now as a mom of adults, this has been a rewarding season for me. On one hand, you look back and you know that you did a lot wrong, but then you also are thankful that you did some things right. They start choosing colleges, where to live, who to date, who to marry. And all the while, it's a different season where we step back and let them make those choices and encourage them. And I have to say a shout out to my son-in-law, Stephanie and Brittany, you did a great job. We love, John and Luke, and they have just become a part of our family. We just love them dearly. And now I am in the season of grandparenting. I have to say, I do love this season. Um, I'm not gonna say it's the most, but it's close because you can love and lavish love and you don't have them 24 seven. It is so amazing. Life is forever a dance between holding a hand and all the while letting it go. Seeing our own frailty and embracing God's hope through his amazing grace. We are all so different, uniquely created by the God of the universe. 
And we as women have so much to offer in every season and with our unique personalities. We have the ability to invest greatly in others and live out the hope of our calling. Also, I've just got to say, we often think that the Supreme Woman is one that is gentle and sweet and kind. And yes, we all try and get there and try to be those perfect women. But God created us with many different personality types. In fact, there was a police recruiter who once asked an officer, what would you do if you had to arrest your own mother? The officer replied, I'd call for backup, sir. Not everyone has a gentle mom. Pastor Ashley spoke two weeks ago, and we are in this series called Faith That Is Greater, or, or greater Than, but she spoke on faith that is greater than fear. Pastor Keith spoke last week that God's provision is greater than our need. And today I speak that hope is greater than despair. We are living in a pandemic. The world has literally shut down. Never in my lifetime would I have imagined that we would be living through this. And um, I've often talked to my mother about the things she went through with World War II and so many things that I just had no un understanding of or past, past uh, pandemics. And here we are in the midst of one ourselves. We stand in awe as we see that in just a short time, life can change dramatically and that we don't have control. We have choices in these kinds of seasons to fear, to despair, or to have faith and trust and hope in someone much greater than us. Despair is birthed out of fear. Fear that things won't change. They will only get worse. Resolving that a good outcome cannot be attained it is steeped in lies, lies that destroy confidence and uproot the resolve to continue. The word hope in itself is commonly used to mean wish or expectation. And actually the strength and power of the word hope actually comes through the person's desire that has the hope. So people can be a pretty amazing when they have hope. However, there's a big difference between hope, just hope on its own, and that we have hope in ourselves, and the biblical hope. The biblical hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised, and its strength is in His faithfulness, not ours. John Davis states, Biblical hope goes beyond positive thinking because it accepts the reality of God's providence, His providence and goodness. My mentor and friend, Alicia Britt-Scholey, once gave me a word study on hope. We were talking about some of my disappointments in life, and she said, you know, I did this word study on hope. I'd like you to see it. Well, I got it through email, and I thought I'd just print it off. I didn't really look at it too closely. And as it was printing, it just kept printing and printing and printing. 23 pages of how hope is used in the Bible. 166 times you can read the the word hope in the word of God. The Bible is teeming with hope. But you know, even as Christians, despair can still be a very real companion. And I understand this because um, there were seasons of depression in my life and there was especially one season that it was a very real companion with me for about a year. Uh, it was in 2003, we had moved to Bristow, Virginia. My husband took a new role uh, with the, our, our, our district, the Potomac Ministry Network. He was over leadership development, home missions, and church planting. And um, we had moved twice in the last year because we had moved from a really wonderful pastorate of eight years, and then we had moved for him to get his doctorate. So we were just one year in Virginia Beach, and that had all been such an exciting time. And then we moved to Bristow, Virginia, and I just felt very alone. I think I was just so tired. I had four children moving twice again, like I said, in a year or so. And um, I just couldn't 
I would just I would just cry and cry and cry in the evenings or early in the mornings when the kids weren't watching. I was homeschooling at the time, so that actually was a good thing because it kept me going and I really wanted to do that well. But it was such a low season for me. I got help with counseling. I reached out to friends. My husband was a wonderful support at that time. But it took a year to finally dig out of that pit. And I'm telling you what the, the main lifeline was, it was the Word of God. Because I knew, I just knew in my heart that my feelings weren't truth, but the Word of God was truth. You know, our life group just finished a book called Switch on Your Brain by Dr. Caroline Leaf. She talks about using the word to transform our thinking and now that it's actually possible to capture every thought. And that's what the Bible says, to make sure you capture every thought. She's clear that it takes intentional application of the word of God and to reflect, to see which thoughts are toxic and why. You see, science is actually now documenting that the brain fires at a greater capacity when it is thinking thoughts that are good. And the Bible has said this for years and years and years, Philippians 4, 8, that whatever is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, think on these things. You know, it's interesting that the Bible does not say, think on how you feel or what you feel. The Bible says, think on what is true and just and good. Our words are often tainted with what ifs, especially in this pandemic. What if we lose everything and can't regain our income? What if, what if my business doesn't recover? What if I get the virus? What if we go to a one world system? As Pastor Ashley said, we need to change our what ifs to even ifs. The what ifs will come, they will always come, but we must bathe our thought life in the hope of Christ and that he is in control. Luigi Giassani was a Catholic priest, writer and theologian who passed away in 2005. He wrote a book that really just, I read parts of it, just studying for this and it's amazing. Giassani personally understood the dynamic hope of Christ and that it is definitely possible to live in that hope. See, his book was called, Is It Possible to Live This Way? An Unusual Approach to Christian Existence, Hope. Well, I'm here to tell you too, along with Luigi Giassani, that it is possible to live with that constant hope. And I wanna focus on three unique reasons that make the hope of Christ different from human hope. Biblical hope is not centered on self, but on God and his glory. Giussani writes, true hope is certainty of the future motivated by the great presence of Jesus. That hope imprints on our, that hope imprints on our conscience and shapes our desires. Romans 5, 2 says, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. This verse helps us to see that faith enables us to see that everything, everything is to bring glory to God. It's not about us. This is our supreme motivation. We sometimes think we're owed, we sometimes think that we are owed tangible prosperity, health, good things. God does provide many good things. He does meet our needs, but other times he sees a bigger picture where he will gain glory and not us. Second Corinthians 3.12 says, we are strong in such hope, hope that is born of faith. We are full of certainty. First Timothy 4.10, we labor and suffer reproach because we have placed our hope in the living God. In order for hope to win over despair, we need to recognize and believe that God is always, always faithful in every situation we find ourselves. So the first, the first reason that biblical hope is different is because it is centered on God and his glory. The second is biblical hope pours out redemption in abundance. 
Psalms 130, three to four, and I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Lord, Lord with capital L-O-R-D, little O, little O, R, little D. If you considered my sins, all caps, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that you may be revered. Beth Moore gave me a little help here in her stepping up Bible study as she unpacked these verses. Verse seven says, Israel put your hope in the Lord, all caps, for there is faithful love with the Lord, all caps, and with him is redemption in abundance. So it actually says that in the Bible, redemption in abundance. And redemption means that you are redeemed, that you can start again. Okay, so the reason why I, I just brought attention to the word Lord is that there are two names for Lord listed here. Actually, there's three, but I'm gonna go through two. Lord, with capital L and small O-R-D, is actually, actually Yahweh, Jehovah God. This is the covenant name for God. And a covenant means a relationship that we have an understanding with each other. And so God is in relationship with us. Lord, all caps Lord, is Adonai, refers, and it refers to God as master and superior ruler of all. So why did the writer use two names here? I believe it's to all the more draw attention to the fact that God is to be feared and revered, and yet he chooses to have relationship with us and forgive us of our sins when we don't deserve it. He responds in faithful love as verse seven says, and gives redemption in abundance. As I was studying this, I felt like shouting. I was so excited. You know, as I was thinking back on motherhood and all that, thinking of all the things I did wrong, of course, Satan brings all that stuff up to you. And do you know how many times I've lived under the weight of my own failings? Can you relate? As Beth Moore states, God is the author of connection and Satan is the author of isolation. The more we feel like we sin and we fail, the more we isolate ourselves. But there is no sin, no failing, no shortcoming that isn't beyond God's forgiveness. And that's the good news of Jesus. The hope of the gospel is that we have forgiveness of sins, that we know that we are sinners. Christ died for us. It's rebirth every single time every failure, for every disappointment, and every sin. You can begin again. Christ is a God that redeems us. There is hope to grow and change, no matter what your age or what season you're in. So many live, even as Christians, in the bondage of the sins past. Or sometimes what's worse is we live in the bondage of the sins others have committed against us. The hope of the gospel frees us to be able to forgive others as well. You know, that's why baptism is so important in the Christian faith. It's because it's a testimony of the old person going down in the water and the new person coming up. Rebirth, forgiveness, a chance to start again. So, biblical hope is not centered on ourselves, but on God and his glory, number one. Number two, biblical hope pours out redemption in abundance. And number three, my closing point is biblical hope is strengthened in times of suffering. One of the biggest questions throughout history has always been, how can a loving God permit suffering? Well, first of all, human suffering does not originate from God, but from man's choice to walk away from God. Remember, God created Adam and Eve in his image, and he created us in his image. He has offered us complete freedom, but he also created us with a free will. No other creature has this. We are able, as, as humans, to contemplate, view our own thoughts, and to choose. Because sin entered the world through man's choice, we live in a world that has many consequences. We are not exempt from these consequences. 
In Matthew 5, 45, it says that just as the sun rises on the good and the evil, it also rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. The fulfillment of destiny often involves difficult paths and trials. When we trust in the hope that Jesus gives, we trust in a strength that is sure and unlike our own. How can we hope as we suffer? It's easier said than done. You see, trials don't define us as Christians. Trials build character. James 1, 2-4 says to consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. It produces perseverance and brings maturity so that you don't lack anything. So we develop patience. And patience actually comes from the word patior, which means to carry on one's shoulders. Jesus says in Luke 21, 19, by your patience, you will possess life. There are two parallel thoughts here, one bearing life and the other being crushed by life in the sense of being crucified. So two parallel roads. For an example, my daughter Brittany is in her ninth month of pregnancy and she's very uncomfortable. I think every woman in the ninth month is. And I always say it's because the Lord then just has us welcome that baby so much, even though we know it'll take pain to get there. But it produces patience because we know if the baby is born early, there may be problems for the baby or for the mother. So we do want it to go full term, even though it's uncomfortable. So it produces patience in us because we have the hope of the baby. So hope is made up of the fabric of patience that is developed through the trials of life. Vanitha Randall Risner contracted polio as an infant in India. She lived in the hospital for years. She had 21 surgeries by the time she was 14. She was bullied in grade school and called a cripple, endured four heartbreaking miscarriages and buried a beloved infant son. If that wasn't enough, in her late 30s, she was diagnosed with post-polio syndrome, a debilitating disease marked by pain and escalating weakness. Later, as profound weakness was setting in, her husband of 17 years left her unexpectedly. Within two weeks, he had moved to another state. She had two daughters, middle school age, left to raise. A life of suffering. However, Vanitha has allowed her suffering to draw her close to Jesus. She wrote a powerful book called The Scars That Shaped Me. And it's actually in your comments section right now. It is a free ebook you can get online and I encourage you to read it. I just couldn't put it down as I was preparing for this message. She writes, I'm starting to see the connection, trying to piece this all together. It seems counterintuitive that the high points of my relationship with God would be connected to the low points in my circumstances. But the ways God, of God are often not what I expect. Perhaps only when I am truly desperate can I hear the Lord's still small voice. Perhaps suffering and sorrow are God's invitation to know him better. And she also goes on to say, when I pour out my heart to God, he changes me. Like my biblical companions, David, Habakkuk, Job, and Jeremiah, I can experience true joy only after I have acknowledged the scars that have shaped me. And when I do, I find myself in a deeper place with the Lord, who helps me reframe my disappointments and my pain. Right now, many are suffering as we face this epidemic epidemic. So many have to face death alone. I can't even imagine. However, there again is the beauty of biblical hope. Those that are in Christ are never alone. Emmanuel is always with us. My piano instructor in college was someone who mentored me, taught me, and believed in me. Betty Palma was an amazing woman. Her husband, Dr. Anthony Palma was the academic dean of the University of Valley Forge when we went there. And she, she, she 
she was not only my piano instructor, she was the head of the piano department. Last month, she passed away in an assisted living home. Her husband, children, and grandchildren were quarantined from her for several months. And yet she still ended up contracting the virus. She passed away within just a few days. As I was praying for her, I was just weeping, just crying for the family, just feeling that sense of, oh, how awful it was to, to just die alone. And the Lord gave me a picture of her bedside and I could see her in her bed and I saw all these angels surrounding her bedside. And the Lord said, and it wasn't in a sweet, still, small voice. It was in a very dogmatic voice to me. He said, she is not alone. She is not alone. Wow. What a hope we have in Christ in the midst of suffering. There is such light and hope. There's hope for eternity. When I sat at my dad's bedside just this past November, I remember I knew that death was imminent and there was no way out. And I felt so futile and so hopeless to be able to help. The Lord was right there and I knew I didn't have to worry about eternity. There was such this sense of peace that I would see my dad again, and I know I will. So the hope of eternal life, it makes death easier to bear. Today, on this Mother's Day, I would like to do something different. I would like us all to get on our knees in our living rooms. And I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance and hope, and I'd like you to join with me and raise your hands to signify repentance. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I know that you came to forgive me of my sins. So I accept this forgiveness right now. Sin no longer has a hold on me. I can walk in freedom as I hold fast to the hope of your redemption. For myself and for others, I can face any situation in life knowing that the trials are there to help produce patience in me and can always bring glory to your name. I place my hope in you. You are faithful, Lord. Amen, amen. There's no darkness in your There's no question in your mind, God Almighty, God of mercy. There's no hiding from your face, there's no striving in your grace, God of mercy God Almighty let there be light open the eyes of the blind purify our hearts in your fire breathe in as we pray Jesus have your way
no taking back the cross no regret in what it cost God of freedom but we sing God of much mom for an amazing message today uh, talking about hope is greater than despair and we would love to hear from you if you have any prayer requests prayer needs um, anything that you would that you need from us just let us know and you can email us and we will get back to you don't forget ladies just drive by our church office at uh, Fairfax corner we'd love to give you a gift and see you there connect with you God bless have an amazing day